All right, so um, where we left off with child development, uh, we talked a lot about the physical, de the physiological development and how children, the, their growth hormones kick in and they're able to um, repair cells and their muscles grow at an exponential rate. Now, as we get a little bit older, now we're, we're still in the childhood range, but we're gonna see things start slow, slowing down. We're gonna see neurocognitive functioning um, not being nearly as robust, but still building in, uh, within the neural networks and the brain cells. Um, so we still see a lot of mental development and cognitive development happening. What we're also going to start seeing really kind of shifting the paradigm a little bit from physical and cognitive, we're going to start to see social start to build in because up until now, uh, who has been really the real, the big source of uh, of, of vicarious learning and um, uh, yeah, just, just learning how to socialize and communicate. It's been parents, right? It's been their immediate surroundings. So as we get into the preschool years at, or at, get out of the preschool years and get into um, school years, we're gonna start to see them expand socially, okay? So uh, we're gonna see morals start to set in because what used to be I'm only gonna do what's right when people are watching is going to turn into integrity where we're doing things uh, right all the time because it's the right thing to do. We start developing that moral compass. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today um, as far as uh, the psychosocial development from Erickson, okay? So um, I know that we've been dancing around a lot of these concepts and we talked about trust versus mistrust and autonomy versus doubt. But today I wanna to kind of break this out and, and spell out what each one of these stages are so we have a better understanding of that as we move forward um, into the adult, uh, early adult, or adolescence, early adult and adulthood. Because the, the Erickson's psychosocial development theory spans the lifetime of an individual. Whereas if you remember, we looked at Piaget, it really only applies up until uh, when we hit stage four, the, the uh, formal operation stage, which would be, um, uh, early adolescence or middle adolescence. Okay. Up until, uh, early adulthood. So that's the limitations of Piaget cognitive development, because that's what we're concerned with, right? We're looking at the cognitive development because past adulthood, we don't really see a whole lot more of development cognitively. Uh, we you know, kind of set our ways. We, we build up our, uh, ability to learn language and uh, ability to study and memorize and all those things earlier on. And then we have those tools later on in life. All right, so let me share my screen so we can kind of map this out. And there's a really, I think there's a really good video either last week or the week before that's very similar to what I'm gonna be presenting today. But just for those of you that did not get it, I, I certainly wanna give you a chance and then um, discuss it a little bit later. Just bear with me as I share my screen. Bear with me. And thank you for not humming the theme to Jeopardy, distracting me right now. I apologize. Now, it doesn't matter how much you prepare for this stuff, something always goes wrong with technology. That's why I say get in, get, do your assignments before waiting till last minute because something always goes wrong with technology. All right. Hopefully, that is there we go. Can you all see a, a white screen? All right. Yep. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So, um, 
what we're going to talk about is uh, looking at Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. So Eric Erickson came around about the same time that uh, Piaget did. In uh, Piaget was born in the late 1800s and lived up until about uh, mid 1980s. And uh, Eric Erickson was a little bit younger than him, but um, he he appreciated the value that Jean Piaget had provided in understanding how we develop cognitively. Um, however, there were a couple limitations that he had noted and un understood that it did apply to just children. It didn't really take into account socialization. You know, what is it like when they when they socialize? Because the first two stages that we see with with children um, are really not socialized at all up until about the age of seven when they start entering the public school systems. So looking at his theory of psychosocial development, and if you remember, um, he was really the second theorist that, that we had mentioned. Uh, so um, here we have Eric Erickson, his theory was really greatly influenced by Freud's theory, but he emphasized the role of culture and society as opposed to just cognitive development or even moral development, which we'll talk about a little bit later with Lawrence Colbert. Okay, so okay. culture, did somebody have a question? They're not seeing anything. They just watch the screen. Oh yeah, okay, I haven't written anything yet. I'm sorry, okay. I'm, I'm still just kind of uh, going on. Um, so culture and society really play here. I'll put something on here just so you know. Um, can you all see that? Yep. Okay. Psychosocial development. So his focus was on culture and society playing a role, okay? I'm leaving this middle blank here so we can uh, kind of break this down a little bit. And um, so another key difference between his theory and Freud's theory is that he suggested that there were plenty, uh, there's really plenty of room for growth and personality throughout the entire life, as I mentioned before. Uh, so this personality development really spans an entire life and not just childhood, um, which is also what Freud had emphasized. So Eric uh, Erickson really assumed that crisis can occur really at each stage of the development. And there are eight of them, which I'll go through. Um, and that uh, these conflicts, they involve differences between an individual and the needs of society and balancing that. And that's kind of where the, the what we call crisis, it's not or conflict, it's not really necessarily a crisis, it can be, especially if it, uh, if it causes some kind of dysfunction. Um, so anyway, but where these are competing, that's where really the successful completion of these eight, eight stages go. Um, one thing to note is while many of you have probably heard of Sigmund Freud and he was a contributor to uh, understanding the subconscious or the unconscious mind, which we do adopt in a lot of what we do with, with, our, uh, with our theories, um, there, there were a lot of drawbacks to him. He was very focused on sexualization. Um, for example, one of, the, one of his laws of attraction where we have an idea of, in our mind of what we're attracted to. And for boys, they're attracted to women who represent their mother. And for girls, uh, they're attracted to men who represent their father. And he kind of just goes through the entire stages. In fact, uh, Jean Piaget, uh, did very like sensory motor stage um, when we were putting things in our mouth. Freud ten, tended to look at that as a sexualization, like an early childhood sexualization. So those kind of theories are no longer uh, really talked about or appropriate. We understand them that, uh, especially in terms of a Piaget, how they, they um, evolved in uh, sensory motor, but we don't really look at that. So Eric Erickson, took a very similar approach to that and looked at relationships, especially earlier on with, with, our, um, with our parents, okay? So just to kind of map this out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put one, we're gonna go through these, each stages, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Now, in terms of looking at this, we're gonna break this down into ages. Now, as I mentioned before, um, age 
is really, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's really, we use it loosely. And, and when we look at these stages, it could be any variation of that, but uh, we're just looking at these ages as an approximation. So uh, just because a child hasn't reached the trust versus mistrust or demonstrated trust versus mistrust uh, by the age of one, doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong. It just might be a slow social development. There might have been some some kind of uh, tumult within the family. Maybe some um, you know one or two parents weren't present. Something like that. So uh, keep that in mind. And usually about before the age of one, we're going to see trust versus mistrust start to take shape. Um, so after we talk about age, we're going to look at the crisis or the conflict. Okay. And again, this is just negotiating what that means to, to have uh, either one side or the other. Um, and let's see what else. We're going to look at the virtue that's gained oops, from uh, the conflicts. And then we're going to see the negative outcome that could also be gained, okay? So with these, um, what we're looking at with the virtue is the positive, okay? And then obviously the negative outcome would be the negative. So if they don't negotiate this or if they negotiate it to one side or the other, that could uh, also be an indication. So we kind of want to have something in the middle. So for example, all right, so as I said, so successful completion at each one of these stages, they can result in a healthy personality and acquisition of these basic virtues in this column, okay, when we're, we're looking at this. So these are, are really basic virtues um, and their character strengths. So when we, uh, as we're going through this, I, I'd like for each of you, um, first of all, to keep in mind somebody uh, that, that might fit these stages, like hold into your, your mental representation. Remember we talked about that, hold into your me mental representation, somebody who uh, might be either on one end of the spectrum or the other. And we're gonna, we're gonna actually have, a, um, have an activity at the end that, that describes us, okay? So let's go into the first theory of Erickson's uh, psychosocial development. So simply stage one, and it occurs around the first year of life. I'm going to actually change the color here because I like a little bit of variation. One year of life. Okay. And this uh, idea, so the crisis that we're looking at is trust versus mistrust. Okay. Um, so right around one year uh, that it's, pretty uncertain, the child is uncertain about the world that they live in. So in order to resolve these feelings of uncertainty, the baby looks towards the primary caregiver or their parents, usually in most cases, for consistent care and stability. Um, and if the child receives this consistent care, they're gonna start to develop that uh, a sense of trust and, and security. Then this is really the theory, this is the hallmark of Erickson's theory of virtue. Okay, so the virtue here that we get is hope. Hope that things are going to be turning out just fine. Things that uh, we're going to be fed in time. Okay, and we develop a sense of trust because uh, we have, um, um, we're almost 100% sure that we're going to be fed, we're going to be cared for, we're going to be nurtured, and we're going to be supported. The failing to acquire this virtue can lead to the development of suspicion and fear and mistrust. So that's really the negative outcome here is fear and suspicion, okay? Now, why would that happen? Or what would the negative consequences later on be in life if we're, if we're not certain of, our, uh, certain of our survival, to rely on others for survival? What do you think? It could lead to the development of um, attachment disorders, the inability to form secure attachments, or the inability to form healthy attachments like right. you have attachments but they're not healthy right and, and if you remember actually i think it's this week we have uh the harlow monkeys um if anybody's familiar with those experiments where the the monkeys tend to gravitate towards the mother uh the wire mother who has uh fur on, on, on yeah i watched that 
Yeah, yeah. So um, that's a trusting environment. As long as she, uh, the, the monkeys are being nurtured and uh, comforted, they feel secure in their environment. But if they're not, that produces a very fearful effect for them. And as uh, Liana mentioned, it could develop into attachment, um, like uh, confused, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, insecure attachment or attachment confusion. All right, so that's probably the worst case scenario that we would see coming out of stage one, trust versus mistrust. So our next uh, stage is going to be, this occurs right around the second year of life is when we see this, again, approximation. Um, and this crisis characterizes the stage uh, of autonomy versus shame or doubt, okay? So write that in here. Versus doubt. Okay, so what is autonomy? Um, autonomy is, is really, when we think of autonomy, we think of independence. And um, then we have doubt or shame would be on the other side. So right around 18 months, the, about the age of three, children begin to uh, assert their independence by walking away from their mother, right? Learning how to pick up toys that they want to play with and making choices about what they want to wear and what they want to eat, so on and so forth. So obviously the child is gaining a sense of independence and autonomy. And Erickson says that it's, it's, uh, it's really critical that the parents allow children to do this. It's critical that children are able to explore their limits um, of their abilities and, and do that within an encouraging and engaging environment. And obviously, right? I mean, that makes sense. Because when we stifle that, that, that might um, make them question their abilities. So rather than putting on the child's clothes, a parent could be supportive and have uh, patience and allow the child to do it on their own and, and keep on trying until they succeed. Because this is kind of where failure versus success or feeling successful in um, not, uh, negotiating failure really starts to take shape. So um, uh, learning and, and teaching the child how to ask for help when they need it uh, would probably be the better lesson out of here. So parents could encourage their, their child to be independent, but at the same time, protect the child. Uh, so failure is not necessarily avoided, but uh, can be negotiated successfully. So the hallmark stage uh, of this uh, uh, for the virtue that's achieved is a sense of independence or their own personal will, okay? So I'll just, instead of independence, I'll just put will, all right? Um, and then the negative outcome that can occur if the child is overly criticized or overly controlled is that they start to feel inadequate in their ability to survive. So this can really start lacking self-esteem and, and start feeling shame or doubt in their abilities. So um, uh, that would be the really the negative outcome. So we can put shame. I'm gonna put self-esteem here. And again, because that's where we start to see self-esteem start to develop or self-efficacy uh, would probably be a better, and we'll talk about the difference between self-efficacy and self-esteem later, but self-efficacy uh, just in short is the uh, feel like we have the ability to complete a task successfully, whereas self-esteem is what our view is of ourselves. But self-esteem we start to see develop here. And we could say self-esteem, like a positive self-esteem would be more virtue, negative self-esteem uh, could be our negative outcome, if that makes sense, okay? So um, that's really all there is to autonomy versus doubt is just building that, that I can do uh, or I can't do without experiencing some kind of negativity. Uh, we see that develop in children, okay? So stage three happens right around three to five years of age um, and in this stage, children assert themselves even more, more frequently, okay? So the crisis that is, that, that is gonna be taken a look at here or that we listed is gonna be initiative versus guilt. And again, if you think initiative, if you think uh, in terms of self-esteem, you know, we're still building that self-esteem, okay? We, and you kind of see the picture we're, we're building here is we have a trusting individual. Um, we have, uh, they're, they're, they feel like they're independent, they can work on their own. And they're also, uh, they're gonna start taking initiative right around three to five years. Now keep in mind, and I do wanna point this out as we're going along here is there is a good balance 
and there's an unhealthy balance for each side of these. So if you think of this, and I'm just going to put this on. Oops, trust. So if we have like a continuum here of trust versus mistrust, what would be, you know, what would be the downfall? What would be a potential pitfall for having too much trust? You get yourself into dangerous situations, either trusting yourself when you shouldn't trust yourself and you hurt yourself or trusting someone else when you shouldn't trust them and getting hurt. Right, right. We've already talked about the negative consequences of mistrust, but there could be um, some some oops, some negative uh, impacts of mistrust, which would might be uh, uh, naivete, right? Naivete. Oops. So, sort of relying too much on the the person that you you develop trust with. Right. Right. It, I can't spell naivete today, so I'm not going to try. Um, so it's somebody that's naive is, is uh, somebody that that relies too much on people and they take their words for it, right? We kind of see that in adulthoods. We might uh, tend to, to display gullible uh, or vulnerable traits as opposed to relying on our own instincts and being able to use logic instead of being self-sufficient on somebody, right? So there could be that. So let's kind of Look at this, and I just want to use a couple examples here. Oops. So, what about if we looked at autonomy or yeah, autonomy versus doubt? What would be the, the pitfall that we want to watch out for? Autonomy, man, I cannot spell today. If we have too much autonomy, because doubt we get that, right? Doubt might play on somebody's self-esteem that they don't feel like they're good enough, or self-efficacy where they don't feel like they can do this on their own, right? But what about too much autonomy? What do you think? Probably uh, difficulty with developing relationships. I guess that's later though. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, it could play into that. You're not uh, necessarily off the mark on that one. But if somebody is too autonomous, then, then they're probably making a lot of mistakes, right? They're, they're um, independent, they're, but they're to the point where nobody is really giving them positive, constructive feedback on something. So they may go, I think of the child that is always being told that they're right, even though they, they may be saying something wrong, they may be pronouncing something wrong, they're constantly, uh, they're constantly praised for even making wrong decisions or incorrect or not so safe decisions. So what we could see is like an overconfidence and in their ability, which might lead them to when we get to initiative and guilt, if they're taking the initiative and they get criticized by somebody else when we get into that social stage, because right around three or five, that's the preschool years, right? But when we get into beyond that, six or 12, we're going to have children that are going to be um, maybe socially criticizing them, which uh, especially if they're doing something that, that's socially unacceptable or incorrect. So that would be probably an example of that. And we're gonna get to explore this when we get into some of our, uh, some of our examples later. All right, so um, looking at initiative versus guilt. So during this period, the primary feature involves the child regularly interacting with other kids, right? Usually in a preschool setting or neighborhood setting or whatever, but because they're, they're already, walking around and running around and probably at this stage figuring out how to ride a bike. So their, their range of socialization is expanding by leaps and bounds. So obviously uh, play is really central to this stage. And children are playing, they're learning how to explore interpersonal skills, they're learning how to initiate and, and uh, plan activities. So they're starting to feel more secure in their ability to lead others and make decisions. So um, Erickson said at this stage, the kid will, they're, they're, as you may know, at uh, age three to five, what is their favorite thing to do? Ask why, right? So they're constantly, well, why? Well, why? Well, why? Because they're exploring. They're, they're trying to use their communication skills and, and understand you and then reflect that back in either some kind of action or understanding. And so really here, the virtue that they're going to reach is purpose. Okay, so what is their purpose? And based on that purpose, how are they going to act or interact with others around them? 
They feel like they have a sense of purpose in what they do and the choices and the, and the, the uh, decisions that they make. And if this tendency is to ask questions and have curiosity squelched, like for example, if we have a parent that says, uh, that, that overly criticizes them or controls the child, uh, they start to develop uh, what would be our negative um, guilt, oops, or inadequacy. Got that right. Um, God, I, I miss spell checker. <laughs> Every time I uh, type something on my phone, it comes up. I think it's probably an E in there. But anyway, uh, um, so really, the, if the, the child feels like they're being annoying to other people, they'll start to act more as a follower versus having that self initiative and that drive and that purpose, which again plays on this this factor here, which is our self-esteem, okay? Um, so having, uh, so too much guilt, on the other hand, can make a child uh, actually really, sh uh, they, they might slow their interacting with others and it can kind of in inhibit their creativity. But obviously this comes with the caveat because we do want some guilt, right? Why do we want a little bit of guilt here, do you think? Kind of guide our moral compass. Right, right. It provides the child with uh, kind of a mechanism of self-control. So they do have some limits, right? We don't want them acting without any uh, regard for feelings for others. So we really need to have these limits in place for them. And, and that's really important in the third stage. So uh, the negative outcome, of course, is a sense of guilt or feeling uh, inadequate. Um, and I will fix that because looking at it, I know that is wrong, okay? So, um, I, I, yeah, all right, so we got that correct. So uh, moving on to the fourth stage, uh, we look at right around the age of six to 12. I'm gonna stop putting year down there. So uh, it happens around six to 12, around school age to puberty. So here is what uh, uh, teachers take an important role, according to Erickson, um, in the child's life, okay? So they're going to start teaching specific skills. The child is gonna, they're gonna start to work towards competence. So their major crisis that's uh, looked at here is in industry versus inferiority. Industry, meaning being productive, right? Inferiority. Inferiority meaning less than, okay? So um, <clears throat> they're gonna be working towards uh, these goals here or, or negotiating this crisis. And at this stage, child, they'll really gain a greater significance uh, and, and greater self-esteem and, and or more positive self-esteem. And they're gonna actually try to start winning the approval from others, from teachers, from authorities, from parents, by demonstrating specific competent, uh, competencies that they think are, are valued in society or at least in their classrooms or homes or neighborhoods or whatever. So they're gonna start to get a sense of pride in their accomplishments. So that's really the virtue here that we're looking at um, is pride or competence. Oops, oops, put that in the wrong area. So pride or confidence. Okay. Um, so that really that's the main virtue for the stage. And <clears throat> children or or the, the child that's encouraged and uh, their initiatives are reinforced, they're gonna start to feel industrious. They're gonna their their confidence is building, they're gaining uh, uh, a better understanding of how to achieve their goals. And now if, if this initiative is not encouraged or if it's restricted, again, if we look at somebody like maybe a helicopter parent or somebody that's a little bit more um, uh, authoritarian, uh, which we'll talk about different parenting styles here, I think on Wednesday, um, they're, they're, they may not be able to reach their own full potential. And this would be the negative outcome is inferiority as, or, uh, I'm just going to put actually incompetence. Okay. 
So they feel incompetent or inferior as a result of not feeling like they have the ability to do stuff on their own and, and gain the approval of others. Uh, so society is really demanding. And again, at this stage, some failure may be necessary so that the child can develop modesty. So like I said earlier, up, up here, there um, has to be some sense of guilt, right? Uh, the, the child has to have some kind of control mechanisms in place to control their actions. Um, so say one's a uh, four-year-old, they, they ha have a little bit of... Uh, um, failure within limits, right? So the child develops modesty and they don't feel overconfident, like we talked about with initiative or autonomy, autonomy versus guilt. Um, and they don't feel like they are uh, completely incompetent. So we want something right in the middle there, probably more towards the left, more towards the industry, you know, in, in, uh, industrious, okay? So want to have that balance in there. All right. So what did you... What would be the over, if you did too much, when you look at the spectrum, if there was too much industry, do you think it's, um, uh, I don't know, something with lack of like seeing the world around you? I don't know. What the yeah, yeah, we would see probably an incomplete uh, picture of reality of that. That, that. that child might think that they're doing something correct when they're doing something at, uh, incorrect. And again, we see that with parental figures and maybe even, earlier in, in childhood because they haven't really been guided by society yet. They haven't been, um, because we see culture and societal norms trickle down from, from generations to generations. So at this point, if this child has not developed a good sense of industry versus inferiority, chances are they are probably very sheltered and they were coddled and there might be uh, too much positive reinforcement for even making uh, incorrect choices or choices that might be uh, questioned by their peers. Okay. So this really is where the rubber meets the road and a child that has not negotiated might be over trusting, over uh, autonomized and taking too much initiative. Um, when they get to about six to 12, that, that would balance out because now we're going to have societal norms correcting that. Their peers are going to be either criticizing them or, or making, or they might be viewing what their peers are doing and realizing that, hey, I, I'm not doing the right thing here. I'm doing something incorrectly. So it kind of, uh, once they get socialized, and this is why socialization is important because we're, we're going to start to adopt other people's points of views and understand that other people, uh, especially our age, have a, a, a a certain view on life and we have to start respecting that otherwise we might be outcasted which um, is not pleasant for any child okay so um, does that answer your question i can see your lips moving can't hear you talking <laughs> kind of um yeah i definitely get like if they've had too much of the mm -hmm. the um uh, the trust too much of the autonomy mm -hmm. um too much initiative how that gets that'll be sort of corrected could be corrected mm -hmm. um on the playground but the as, as, yeah i guess what happens if um if the kid is has learned okay i can do things i'm in like i think of industriousness as just like um very action oriented all the time yeah, yeah absolutely so would that be if somebody's has too much industry would that be you know maybe they're like lack of um, thoughtfulness or? I would say lack of awareness of their own competence. So let's okay. uh, give you an example. Right around this age, we're gonna see children riding bicycles and a child sees another child riding a bicycle and he's thinking, he or she is thinking in their head that, uh, well, um, I can do all these other things. I can just get on a bike and go. That would be an example. If they don't have that built-in protection in place saying, hey, this is a new task. Maybe I should look at, at uh, other children doing it a little more carefully or maybe get on it a little bit slower. They might just get on that bike and try and take off, which could be a disastrous if they think that they can just do anything, uh, especially new tasks. Um, so that that would I think that would be where the overconfidence comes in into play. And we kind of see that with uh, people we work with, right? They, they, they think that they can do something that they can't. Um, and it affects other people or puts themselves in danger uh, in, in doing those things, right? So um, it, it, that's kind of what we're talking about. And again, we're, gonna, we're leaning more towards the left here 
We want to, to be industrious, but we also want to have that mechanism, that safety mechanism in place that uh, guides them to say, this is a new task, this is a new situation. Maybe I should throttle back a little bit and learn as opposed to just taking the bull by the horns and going. Is that, does that make sense? Okay. Um, and again, we look at that with, with relation to, can they be a learner? Are they able to hang back and, and learn a new task as opposed to assuming that they can just do that and, and making critical or um, uh, grave errors in judgment on those, okay? I actually lived with someone like that who didn't have that like understanding that they couldn't do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a nightmare. So the only, per the only other, like this person had never lived with anyone outside of his family unit. And then he moved into a house with four people that he didn't know and was just so sure that he knew everything and that he was able to do this, that, and the other thing. And it ended in disaster. Okay. Then what happened as a result? Absolute disaster. Um, really, really prideful mm -hmm. individual. Um, I personally set boundaries with this individual that they violated time after time um, and would give me the excuse of, oh, I'm a triplet. I don't understand boundaries. Okay. Um, and stuff like that. And just real like social incompetence. Mm -hmm. that they were unwilling to see mm -hmm. and it was an absolute nightmare okay it was an absolute nightmare so like so, um, that that's how like i'm i'm thinking about this person as we're going through this and i'm like this person never learned any of this and yeah. when i'm when we were living together like they were 20 22 23 and clearly did not get these aspects of psychosocial development. Yeah, yeah. And that, that would be the danger, for a, especially from a social standpoint, is relatable to other people. So this, this, uh, this person, um, and I'm just going to use this person as an example, might have a difficult time leading people, right? Because they're going to lead them into situations that are not good for business or not good for um, customer relations or whatever, you know, fill in the blanks. So that, that would be the, 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 um, the danger of having too much industry. Now, like I said, we want to remain in that area, but at this age, teachers and caregivers are looking at doing, at, at, uh, at, at positive feedback, okay? So throttling them back a little bit, just saying, hey, out of safety concerns, maybe you shouldn't get on that bike. Let me show you how, how to do this. Not necessarily telling them no, but uh, showing them the proper way to do things as opposed to uh, letting them take the bull by the horns and injure themselves or injure other people or, um, you know, that, that, that sort of stuff. So yeah, the situation it. ended with us actually having to get like mediation and okay. the mediator told this individual, so clearly you're not you're not mature enough to be in this situation. Okay, okay. And it, it's, yeah, it's kind of like the, maybe you're not ready to ride that bike. Right, but right. Th this person had never heard that in their entire life. <laughs> and right. just was so taken aback by someone telling them, Maybe you're just not ready. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's uh, not necessarily anything that's not correctable. It's something that, that could eventually, you know, 23, we're, we're still looking at um, the rest of their lives and probably able to figure that. I've known people like that too, that were able to humble themselves. We see people tend to be a little bit more humble when it, when it comes to um, their pride and, and, uh, versus their inferiority. Um, so anyway. Uh, so let, let's we kind of run up on time here. So I want to make sure we get through all of these and hopefully have time for our activity. So the next stage is the, uh, the fifth stage is going to be around 12 to 18 years of age. So really, we're looking at adolescence in this, this uh, stage. And this is the transition from childhood to adulthood. And there are several marks that we see happen uh, going through 
uh, middle school and entering into high school uh, where they're starting to experience emotions and feelings and understanding of other people's feelings and all that good stuff, right? Um, so this is probably one of the most important roles in Erickson's personality uh, uh, or psychosocial development theory. So here, the child or the teenager, now they're actually becoming more independent and they're, they're trying to look uh, really towards their futures in terms of careers and relationships and, and really even their families or whatever. So they want to start feeling like they belong to society and that they fit in. So this is a major crisis looked at here is identity versus role confusion, okay? Identity, just like it sounds, how, what, what is their, you know, kind of going back to um, their purpose, right? This is building upon their purpose or role confusion. They really don't know where they belong or who they are, okay? Um, now, some degree of this is pretty normal, but, um, you know, especially at a college level, I see children or uh, I see um, I see young adults coming out of high school with no idea what their capabilities are or what they're what they want to do. We see parents that are shoving them into a direction of school, which they may or may not be ready for yet, which could be a disaster for them or it could be a, a big success for them to be pushed out and, and to explore things. So it really depends on how they negotiate the rest of these. Um, but I can say that that uh, a, a child without with role confusion and forced into uh, a college situation uh, has a potential for disaster for that person. All right. Or they may negotiate that and figure out who they are a little bit later. Right. So really, in this stage, the child has to learn the rules that they'll occupy as an adult. And they, they start exploring what that may look like, either hypothetically or talk with others. So they may actually re-examine their identity to try and figure out who they really are. And we look at uh, body image playing a huge role in this because the body uh, really is constantly changing from um, uh, during, uh, right around after puberty, right? And they explore possibilities of, uh, you know, what they're good at doing, what they're not good at doing, or what they like or what they, dislike. And based upon those outcomes, they start to form this identity as a result of this exploration. Now, failure to do or to go through this um, really can result in things like a child may say, uh, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, and when I say child, I'm talking about 12 to 18 years old. So maybe I should say adolescent, uh, but it can lead to role confusion. So the positive virtue that we have is um, really we're looking at, at fidelity. Like they, they know exactly what they're, what they're wanting um, and, and they're, uh, uh, they're able to see themselves as unique or as an integrated person um, as they're trying to identify who they are. Now, the negative outcome from this is, like I said, more confusion, obviously. So it can result in confusion of who they are. Uh, it could cause rebellion and feelings of unhappiness as they try and explore maybe the dark sides of, of their desires um, that could come in the form of trying different drugs to mask uh, negative emotions or, or some of those negative identity feelings that they're having. So the hallmarks here really... Um, here at stage five would be, would be like rebellion. You'd see rebellion or confusion. Okay. Um, so moving on to say, and again, we, we want a good balance, probably more towards the identity side on this one, because we want people to be sure who, of who they are. But one of the things I always say is just on the air of caution, we don't want it far left on identity. And the reason being is because we want them to have a little bit of openness. Like maybe this is not who I am set in stone. Maybe this label doesn't necessarily have to apply 100% of the time. Maybe I'm, I'm going to, I, I like the idea of being a doctor, but uh, maybe I like to be a little risky at times too. Maybe I want to do a wingsuit or, or jump out of an airplane or something like that. So being open to suggestions instead of being typecasted into one role. Uh, being open to having uh, the ability to explore other areas as well. So we, we want a little bit to, to, we definitely want to the left, but we want to have them um, uh, be open to new experiences as well. All right, so moving on to stage six, we're going to see this 
probably around um, uh, about young adulthood. So 18, 18, about 40, you know, 35, 40 years of age. And um, this really is looked at, we look at the stage as intimacy. versus isolation. Now, earlier on, they're, as they're developing their identities, they're starting to also explore what relationships are like right, in, in the stage five, right about 12 to 18 years. They are already looking at intimacy, but right about stage six is where they start to solidify that a little bit more. Um, and they're assuming that you know, as they're younger, they begin to share themselves. And, and if you think back on us, we used to share ourselves right around uh, 18 to or, uh, 12 to 18 years old, right? Start to talk a little bit more about emotions. And as we get a little bit beyond towards the later stage of that five, eight, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18 years of age, uh, we become more intimate with other people we're trying to find uh, in love, right? We're trying to explore relationships leading to longer term commitments, especially when we get into stage six. Um, and completion of this stage can really lead to comfortable relationships in a sense of commitment and safety and care, right? Uh, avoiding uh, intimacy at this stage can lead to negative outcomes such as isolation or loneliness or maybe even depression. So we're forming close personal relationships, and this is characterized by love and acceptance. Um, and the negative outcome um, would be, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put unhappy or depression or lonely. Maybe loneliness. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think lonely is uh, not necessarily, I mean, somebody might be lonely and not exhibit the, the obvious signs of, of depression, um, but they might not feel exactly fulfilled, okay? So that moves us on to the seventh stage, uh, which occurs right around, uh, right around re uh, before retirement age. So later, like middle adulthood. Um, so right around 40, I'm going to say to 65. Um, and here we begin to establish that they already have a good career. They've got a, a they're in probably at this age in something that they love doing and they begin to settle down in their relationships. Um, either they begin to have families or they are already in the middle of raising their families. Um, and this is really the center of their lives. And we're going to be following this track a little bit later on in the, in the semester. But just to kind of give you a little bit of insight as to where they're going with this, they begin um, to look at family as the center picture, right? What is going to be the next stage? What is their legacy going to be? Uh, so here the crisis is generative, or I'm sorry, um, uh, generative versus stagnation. Generativity versus stagnation. Um, and so stagnation really means it's feeling that uh, the individual is stuck. They're not, not progressing. They're not gonna be leaving a legacy. So there's usually adults that feel like they, um, that they can't give back or they're not in a place to give back to anything. All right, Professor, so- can I ask you something? Sure. The, the the legacy you were I mean the le legacy word you use how um, stands for what which kind of stands or meaning like, okay so, so legacy would mean uh, giving on to uh, your your children yeah you know, producing some kind of wisdom or some kind of well I'm not gonna say wisdom because uh, that's that really falls into our next one but leading up into what are we passing on are are we able to provide for our families. Uh, as well as maybe contribute to the community, or are we just kind of stuck in a dead end job that we're living paycheck to paycheck? Our kids aren't getting what they want, uh, what they need, or what they want, um, uh, and, and our relationship might not be good. So that would be the example of stagnation: is if they're they're feeling that stuck feeling. Whereas generativity um, and, and leading to a legacy: what are we giving to our children? Uh, maybe are we making a name for ourselves or are we leaving them something that they can use later on in life? And that could be a form of wisdom or money or inheritance or whatever. So we start thinking about that during our generative stage. Does that make sense? 
Sam, yeah. I would also say that um, I would add that legacy is kind of like, how do you want to be remembered? You know, how right. are you remembered once you're gone? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I'm hearing so much the legacy people using, and mm -hmm. I always <clears throat> check the translation, but I couldn't find the like the norm of meaning the people use on society. Yeah. Yeah. One more time, Joe. What What did you say? Um, I that it legacy is sort of the way that you want to be remembered. How are you going to be yeah. remembered when you're gone? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I don't know you you guys watching the opera. I'm <laughs> watching sometimes and she always talks like what is your legacy is and she also has like oh. cute about it. And I'm like, what does that mean? And I think it's so important. I just try to figure that out and check that everywhere. But yeah. <laughs> It's so okay. nice to like you guys mention it and thank you for it. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. Well, we were able to, to, to help you with Oprah. <laughs> um, I love Oprah, by the way. I think she's, she's a remarkable woman. And Me too. <laughs> it gives a lot back to, uh, to her community, okay? Um, so uh, it, we can say Oprah as an example would be generative, right? She, she displays a lot of generativity. Um, she's got a, a sure, uh, grasp of her identity, right? Uh, she, I, it seems like she's a very trusting person, a very competent person, and a great communicator as well. Um, so anyway, uh, so as they're they're exploring this generativity, they begin to develop a sense of care for others, and they're looking out for the welfare of others, especially in their family and especially in their communities. So that's what we would we would look at care as being the virtue, okay? Uh, the negative outcome that can occur to fail this uh, or, or to achieve these objectives um, would be to feel stagnation. They feel unproductive. Okay, they they feel empty, purposeless, unproductive. Um, they may not feel like they can be a contributing part of society. Which, again, on the extreme side of things, we might see features of depression or features of anxiety um, tend to to crop up with that. Okay. All right. So let's get to the last stage here, um, which is 65 to, I'm going to say 100, because we are all going to live to 100 with advances of medical technology, right? Um, but 65 plus is what we're looking at here. Uh, so it, it, it really, this happens in until death. And we really see this stage in our senior citizens. And citizens, we, uh, we tend to um, slow down, right? And, and we perfect our productivity. We've accomplished a lot in life that we wanted to do or we wanted to see and we, uh, or maybe we, we didn't, right? We, we didn't accomplish what we wanted to do or see, or we didn't travel enough or we didn't uh, spend enough time with our family. So um, here we're really exploring the life as a retired person. And here the major crisis is integrity versus despair. Now, I always use the Air Force, you know, the Air Force terminology for integrity, always doing what's right when nobody's looking. But for the purpose of this, and it's a very similar thing, it's, it's feeling like we have a good moral compass, we have a, a sense of white, what's right and wrong. And obviously, um, in older age, we become more wise during this time and, and um, we contemplate, like looking back on our lives and reminiscing and uh, the people that we had relationships with at, at this age. And we start to realize that um, our lives are either productive or unproductive, right? Uh, which we kind of explored in stage seven. So there may be maybe even a feeling of guilt about uh, the past or realize that we didn't accomplish something or maybe we did something wrong that we want to pay some kind of penance um, and uh, wanted to do uh, to, to maybe go back in time. We, some people with with more of the despair might feel like they want to go back in time and fix something. People on more of the integrity side feel like they've done just enough and that they're exactly where they want to be um, and, and not having really any regrets or feelings of dissatisfaction. So the main virtue here is wisdom. Feeling, uh, feeling the wisdom, being able to help people with, uh, with, with whatever knowledge and experience that they gained in their lives to help them better that their lives, right? So we might see somebody displaying that wisdom is talking with young people and maybe even traveling around and, and helping them 
to accomplish what they want in life. And it could be in the form of seminars, teaching, whatever. But if we feel like we haven't accomplished that, uh, what we wanted in life, we, uh, we might feel unproductive and that can lead to despair or dissatisfac dissatisfaction upon death. Uh, so success in the stage will lead to wisdom and, and that enables a person to look back in their life with a sense of closure and completeness and also be able to accept death without really any kind of fear. Um, so Erickson's map of, of our stages through life and uh, so, oh yeah, I'm sorry, dissatisfaction is the This is the negative outcome here. Um, so what I would like to do, I, I wanted to break us off into groups, but maybe what we can do is think of maybe a fictional character or uh, maybe even an actual person in life that might be more to the left here um, who displays trust, autonomy, initiative. Um, and it could be of any of these age groups here, but let, let's, uh, who do you think would be a good example of somebody that, that would be more to the left of each one of these without being over, uh, I think we have some examples of, of maybe being over industrious. Um, I wanted to add that along the same lines, I guess, when you were talking about Oprah as being a good example of um, you know, stage seven, I think she's also a great example of somebody that, um, grew up in a really rough, like had a lot of really unfortunate circumstances in her life when she was young. So certainly did not come out of, you know, those early years with uh, hope, will and purpose potentially, but obviously achieved them along the way. So just as an example of how these don't really have to be, you know, at those times, at those years. That's great. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I would agree with that. And, and, and uh, this is kind of what I, I mentioned a little bit uh, before is once the, the individual, uh, once the, the child or young adults gets into the, the, the real world and starts to socialize, there could be that moment of, of becoming humble and understanding, hey, you know, maybe I didn't get that right. Maybe I wasn't able to piece that together. And that's what we really, when we talked about intelligence earlier, that's a good mark of intelligence is somebody that's able to bounce back from that and start to fit in and start to own uh, what society has to offer and what they have to offer society is in terms of their skills and talents. So you're absolutely right. I think that's a great example where uh, Oprah uh, probably had a little bit more of the mistrust side and had the doubt and didn't feel safe and secure. But once she found her own stride and she found her own purpose, uh, might have been a little bit later. Than three to five years of old, uh, three to five years of age, um, she did kind of realign everything, and now she probably is more of a trusting person and, and definitely autonomous and uh, uh, has a purpose. So, good example. Um, I think she become more uh, the person like she needed when she was child. Like mm -hmm. she, she become the person that she offer the others to like she was expecting someone around when she she was young i think and i think it's yeah. Really beautiful yeah yeah and and she was probably very fortunate to um uh, you know get out of bad neighborhoods you know that, that that's always a possibility not always the case some people are stuck in that lifestyle and we see that in a lot of poverty impoverished communities where uh, children are unfortunately stuck in those lifestyles and, and grow up to adults that uh, perpetrate that or, or, or perpetuate those lifestyles as well um, and those choices. So uh, luckily, you know, she, and I don't know what her turning point is. I don't know her whole history. I do know that she did come from a not so great childhood, but um, at some point there was some kind of inspiration for her that she was able to learn from, she was able to adapt to and uh, move on to do great things and, and give back to the community. And we do see that a lot. It's not, it doesn't mean anybody's typecasted. If they're starting out far right, they're gonna stay that way their entire life. It could happen, especially if there's not some kind of intervention in one of those stages where they can start to adapt and overcome. But a uh, great example. Um, all right, any questions on any of this stuff? I know we're up on time here. Um, for the example, for like the, 
other end of the spectrum be like the wizard in the wizard of oz who like ha- basically didn't trust people to show who he truly was but mm-hmm. also thought of himself as such this uh, such a grandiose character that he made this persona of mm-hmm. the wizard of oz right yeah we saw a little bit of narcissism in there i think too right and and at, at the end uh just because it, it kind of a, it's a fictional example but we do see that a lot is Based on the the heart of the lion, the uh, courage. You know, I'm, really, I'm hoping I'm not butchering this. Courage of no, courage of the lion, heart of the Tin Man. Uh, what was the straw man? What was his <laughs> brain? Brain. That's right. Yeah. Well, he had a brain. And Dorothy. You know, uh, based on 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 those positive qualities, we saw that shift. We saw that humbling. Uh, with the wizard. So that's you know, like I said, it's a fictional example, and it doesn't happen that easily uh usually but uh yeah yeah great example all right any other questions anything before i uh let me actually stop recording now i do have one question 